Perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Nazanin Golami. I am a second year master's student uh, at Quash Center for Research in Occupational Safety and Health at Laurentian University, and I am doing my internship with OCAV this semester. And as you might be all aware, we are doing a presentation on deep between contracture. Um, okay, next slide, please. Tara. Thank you. So, what is Dupuytren contracture? Um, it's a progressive disabling disease of the fascia, uh, which affects the palm and the digits of the hands, and it results in the thickening and contracture of uh, fibrous bands on the palmar surface of the hands and fingers. Um, it's slowly progressive, but uh, it has irreversible flexion of the fingers. Um, and it has a small painless nodules that develops in the crest closest to the ring and little fingers in the beginning stages. And as it progresses, uh, the nodule develops into a fibrous cord that's extending under the skin of the palm into the fingers, which will eventually draw the fingers towards the palm. So as fingers are affected, it, it becomes really difficult or almost impossible to do certain daily activities, uh, which those could include getting dressed, washing, or any other task that involves the use of the hands. So basically, the manual dexterity will be affected. Would be perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, so it's more common in men than women, and um, its prevalence increases with age. In terms of the anatomy of the hand and uh, the structures that are affected uh, because of Dupuytren contracture, um, would you okay, perfect? Thank you. So those would be transverse carpal ligament and palmar fascia. So we can get another view of palmar fascia here. Fascia is really important for you because it it has a very it's very strong and it gives you the strength to actually grip objects. So in the next slide, we can see that uh, the muscles and the tendons that are responsible for bending and flexing your fingers includes flexor digitorum profundus muscles and flexor digitorum profundus uh, uh, tendon. So this is the action. So this is how they work to bend uh, your fingers and thumb. Next slide, please. In terms of the palmar fascia itself, it's triangular in shape. It has great uh, strength and thickness. Uh, it's a continuation of the palmaris longus tendon, and it divides into four slips, uh, which goes uh, for each finger in, in the picture, as you can see. It provides a tough uh, gripping surface for the hand, and as the nodules from the Dupuytren contracture form uh, in the palm of the hand, it begins to blend and skin becomes really puckered. And underlying the skin of the fascia start to contract and cause an impairment of the hand and finger function, and we will get to that uh, how that happens. So this is flexor tendons on the skin, as you can see. Those are the tendons that I just talked about. So and they are cushioned um, or protected in terms of functionality by tendon sheets. They're like a tunnel in, in this picture. But as the disease progresses, um, next slide, perfect. So nodules actually form under the skin. So this is the progress of the disease. And, and after that, uh, you can see that the uh, nodules and the fibrous cords are actually trapped behind the tendon sheath here, and they exert tension on that tendon. So you can see the functionality is compromised, and with cord being rigid and trapped, it exerts tension, and I just mentioned, on the tendons. Next slide, please. So the finger starts to bend due to this tension that's created. And as you can see, it could affect multiple fingers, uh, it, which are which includes your uh, little finger and uh, the ring finger usually. And usually the Dupuytren contracture is bilateral, so it happens in in both hands. Next slide, please. So in terms of the symptoms, um, in the earlier stages, it as I mentioned, it begins uh, with a lump at the base of the affected finger, and it most commonly affects uh, the ring and little finger. So majority of cases uh, will occur in both hands, and uh, as I just mentioned, and seldom is associated with pain unless fingers are forced into hyperextension. And as the disease progresses, it's going to lead to an inability to extend the affected fingers from flex positions, and you will eventually end up with a decreased range of motion of the affected fingers, which eventually can result in a loss of normal grasping. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of the diagnosis, uh, a lot of measurements are important in order to uh, to actually uh, follow up on the progression of the disease. So it's typically uh, based on the physical examination with no special tests required. And hand is examined to test for the flexibility and the feeling you in your thumbs and in your fingers. Range of motion is very important, uh, which will be measured in the fingers and measuring and recording the location of the nodules and the bands on the palm are also very important. And the contraction and the curling of the fingers will be measured in order to compare them to the previous measurements. Great, thanks, Naz. Uh, no now, before we get into truly understanding uh, a bit more about Dupuytren's contracture, we need to go back and do a quick rehash of Epidemiology 101. Uh, for a lot of the studies we're going to be talking about, they use a measurement called the odds ratio. Now, the odds ratio is a measure between the association of an exposure and an outcome. It represents the odds that will occur within a given particular exposure compared to the odds of the outcome occurring with the absence of that exposure. The higher the number means the greater the association. So an odds ratio of two means that the outcome is twice as likely to occur. If the value is close to one, it's a weaker association. So an odds ratio of 1.2 means it's 20% increase in an outcome with a given exposure. And if an odds ratio is less than one, there's actually a protective effect. So for example, with an odds ratio of 0 0.2, that means there's an 80% decrease in the odds of an outcome occurring the given exposure. Uh, along with this is a confidence interval. The confidence interval is the probability that a population parameter will fall between a set of values. Normally it's measured with a 95% certainty and the narrower the confidence interval, the more precise the estimate actually is with respect to the odds ratio. Whereas a wider confidence interval indicates a less precise estimate. So in the first example, we have an odds ratio of 5.2 with a confidence interval of four to six. In the second example, a confidence interval of 0.5 to 26. So given the fact that it's into the protective range of less than one and well beyond uh, five, the association of the second one is a lot weaker. So it's important to know this when you're actually reviewing scientific studies. Now, with respect to causes of Dupuytren's contracture, the etiology is extremely complex. This is one of the least understood and researched musculoskeletal disorders, as well as being based on flawed or outdated research as well. Many of the studies normally consist of small sample sizes, which makes the links that authors have made very questionable. Now, non-work-related risk factors can include age being over the age of 40, gender, alcohol consumption, diabetes, certain medicines, cigarette smoking, nutritional def deficiencies, and genetic background. With respect to age and gender, uh, initial research was sta stating that it mostly affected Northern Europeans and people of Scandinavian descent. However, this is not necessarily true. It is more common in men and it does usually seem to start in middle age. For alcohol consumption, the research has found an increased risk when the number of alcoholic beverages increases based on consumption per day. With respect to diabetes, there's a bit of controversy over the relationship, being is there a stronger relationship between the onset of Dupuytren's with type one or type two diabetes? And is it actually the diabetic condition that is causing this or a secondary effect, which is normally a reduction in blood flow and nerve supply going into the extremities? Uh, only one real study uh, looked at epilepsy and found that having a history of epilepsy did have an increased risk of developing Dupuytren's uh, contracture, but the odds or the confidence interval was actually quite wide. For smoking, uh, an association was also shown, but the question then comes to rise again, is it due to smoking 
or is it the secondary effect of a reduction in circulation going into the hands again? Now we're gonna spend a fair bit of time looking at the genetic link. Uh, it's one of the main reasons that the Dupuytren's contractors claims are denied by the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board here in Ontario, or at the WSIAT level, as Dave explained. He mentioned an author uh, whose name was McFarland, who uh, placed very great weight on the genetic influence for the development of Dupuytren's contracture. He stated that Dupuytren's disease is a familiar disease and thus a genetic influence. This was based just on our, our review of literature at the time with no actual research being done. Now, with respect to links of European descent, other studies have been done on other populations that have also found increased risks in different populations. Uh, two of those looked at African populations and another one actually looked at a Chinese population. So to say that it's exclusively uh, in those of European descent is actually false. Now the current WSIAT discussion paper uh, from 2002 that's in the archive section of the link that Dave showed states that again, Dupuytren's disease is a genetic disease and it's inherited. Now this is actually based on a 1963 article by Link. So this is 56 years old. And in the study, Ling is actually citing papers from eight, as far back as 1833, 1948, and 1932, and 1934. Uh, these studies had very small sample sizes and had very high uh, incident rates, 10% uh, for the 1833, 44%, and 33%. Unfortunately, with the last two articles from 32 and 34, they were in German and I wasn't able to translate them. Now, within the link paper itself, the study only looked at 50 subjects and found that 68% of them had a family member with Dupuytren's across four generations. So once again, uh, it was a small sample size. The selection of the subjects is questionable. He states that there's a high incidence in the general population in this study. When he looked at data, he said that 42% of males from Edinburgh, Scotland, over the age of 65 had Dupuytren's, which seems really odd. Uh, you know, a study by D. Benditti in 2011 did a review of uh, the 2007 census data in the United States and actually found that Dupuytren's contracture had a rate of 0.2% based on the U.S. population at that time. So 42%, 0.02%. Once again, the association doesn't really quite work. Now, when they say he looked at family uh, links across number of generations, uh, the red arrows are indicating the person who he was looking at for his main subject. And basically, uh, part of the flaws of this data is the blue arrow uh, at the very top, number two, four, these are actually hearsay evidence. So the, I think my great grandfather may have had Dupuytren's, but I don't know for sure. And of course the person was deceased and could not actually be examined. Any of the subjects with a star beside them were physically examined. But then there's also other subjects used that may have been developing. So uh, to look at it at, from this point of view and basically ask people to think back is not a really great way of actually determining uh, genetic links. This paper also did mention some underlying conditions that could increase the risk, but occupational factors, sort of what even, what do you do for a living, were not asked. So as mentioned, the previous uh, study, the percentages were very small. And sample size has a really large effect on results. For example, if I had 10 subjects, and three of them had regularly occurring nosebleeds, then my results are 30% of the population will have regularly occurring nosebleeds. The problem with this is this isn't actually true. And that's why small sample sizes really have to be watched. Now the WSIAT paper also cites a study by Matthews in 1979, who states that the expression of a gene is less complete in females 
which accounts for lower incidence and later onset amongst the female population. The study actually found that there was higher, it was based on one female subject who then her family was examined, that there were higher rates of dupatrins within the female population of her family than the male. So then th this makes one question is how can the WSIAP paper say uh, these factors are genetic when they're referencing papers that are over 50 years old and there's a different thing in genetic causes such as male inherited versus female inherited. Uh, the current paper by Hearst uh, was written in 2002 stated that once again, 82% of patients with Dupuytren's disease were from Northern European families. And once again, we've disproven that. It also references an article by Bauer in 1990, who states that the incidence of Dupuytren's disease amongst individuals with HIV exceeds that of the general population. My question is, since when was HIV a genetic disorder? So Wisniak places so much emphasis on the work of McFarland, who is well documented over his bias of the work-related factors, as well as does not provide a non-biased, well-researched document in which to be making determination of people's compensation claims. Many of the more recent studies and textbooks that begin by stating Dupuytren's a genetic disorder still reference many of the same articles by McFarland and Ling where they also do look at some lifestyle factors, but once again, fail to address the occupational risks. Now, some more recent genetic studies, such as uh, Descartes in 2014, uh, examined data from several independent studies of the same subject in order to determine trends to assess associations. So by reviewing studies from 1951 to 2007, they found only 23 met their basic criteria to be deemed a decent study to be used. Upon further review, only nine of those studies met their qualification to be deemed a high quality uh, review. So after reviewing these nine studies, they found that the odds ratio for manual work to be work related was 2.02, .02, and of the high quality studies, only 2.01. For vibration, they found about 2.9 for an odds ratio, and for the high quality studies, 2.1. Other studies, such as Muranova, uh, concluded that we suggest that Dupuytren's disease should be considered as an occupational disease. Lorati in 2017, personal risk factors include workers from Northern European descent and workers that are older than 50 years. However, new evidence has shown that certain occupational activities may increase the risk of developing these disorder. Lucas concluded that after adjusting for personal risk factors, manual work, and especially those tasks involving manual handling and vibratory tools, there was an association with the development of Dupuytren's contracture. Paul Muir concluded it was determined that long and elevated levels of vibratory exposure contributed to the development of this disorder. So some investigators believe that genetics also may only predispose an individual to the condition rather than causing it. But I think one of the most important things that are overlooked, especially with these older studies that were done between 1932 and 1980 that are being referenced, was a historical trend and societal norms in that Historically, it was almost dictated that the son would follow in the footsteps of their father and work an apprentice in the same industry and work in the same occupation, especially in European countries. So was it genetics or was it just the fact that the father and the son have the same occupation and as a result, the same occupational exposures? Now, we at OCAL uh, here at Sudbury actually had a client who's diagnosed with Dupuytren's with significant hand-arm vibration exposure. And it turned out that he actually had an identical twin brother who worked in an office environment and didn't have Dupuytren's. So identical twins are very similar to one another at a genetic level. So maybe this should be the focus for future studies when it actually comes to looking at uh, genetic links. Now, unfortunately, uh, both of the, 
the client and his brother did pass away. Uh, so as a result, they couldn't help you reach for any further follow up on our part to see even see uh, to explore any of these links. Okay, in terms of the work related causes um, of deep between contracture, there are three um, significant uh, risk factors that has been talked and researched. Uh, one would be single hand injury, manual work, and the lastly would be vibration. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into the details of those risk factors, uh, as it was uh, mentioned by Trevor, uh, research is very limited and uh, in literature with regard to Dupuytren contracture. Just to give you an example, if you do a research in PubMed uh, with regard to uh, Dupuytren's and work vibration, only two studies will uh, show in the last five years, or Dupuytren's and uh, work for the last five years would be only three studies or dupuytrens and vibration, only four studies. So the disorder is perhaps the most uh, under research uh, musculoskeletal disorder. And uh, it's, it's known cause uh, being really unclear due to the lack of research. So um, as Trevor just elaborated, is it genetics only, or is it work related, or is it something that's affected by both of these factors? And we might know that that's actually the case. Um, many studies also tend to be anecdotal. So uh, elaborated on case control, ca cases studies by clinici by clinicians or surgeons, and it cannot be used to demonstrate an association, although they are valuable, but we need more research. Next uh, slide, please. So one of the most uh, comprehensive reviews at the time, and it is still considered one of the key articles with regard to dupuytrens is has been done by Liss and Stock in 1996, who uh, re examined the data from previous studies in order to determine the work relatedness of dupuytrens. And this is important because the, those were the, the ones who actually put forward the occupational relatedness of dupuytren contracture, uh, up to dupuytren contracture. So, and they found one study that deemed met their acceptance quality and addressed the relationship of dupuytrens and manual work, and three studies that uh, regarded uh, with the relationship of dupuytrens and vibration, and all of the four studies uh, showed a positive association with at least a doubling of risk. So coming back to the risk factors of uh, single hand injury and dupuytrens, research has shown that dupuytrens might result from a complication of hand injury. There are many case reports of uh, dupuytren that follow up in time after a single hand injury, and the classification of a sin uh, single hand injury could include uh, penetrating wounds, crush injuries, fractures, and it's more acceptance uh, exists by clinician and compensation boards of the association between dupuytrens and single hand injury than currently is between chronic manual work and dupuytren contracture. So there was a study that also Trevor mentioned, Lucas, in 2008 uh, with a sample size of 2,406 um, participants. It examined the role that hand trauma plays uh, on the development of the patient contracture, and they found uh, a history of hand trauma actually had an odd ratio of 1.5 uh, with a confidence interval between 1.1 to 2.2. And most single uh, hand injuries uh, studies um, are cross-sectional in, nat in nature and in design. And that's important to point out because there are some inherent uh, limitation with regard to cross-sectional studies and you have both the exposure uh, and the disease present at one time. So one would be the survivor bias um, and those who have developed the disease will inevitably leaving the workforce. And that's going to lead to an underestimation of risks among those who still are employed and considered healthy workers. The second limitation would be the prevalence data. So when exposure and disease are obtained at the same time, uh, it's not very easy to use to be used uh, to for us to determine uh, the cause and effect relationship because of the, that temporal sequence of exposure and a development that uh, of the disease that is not established just because of the nature of the designs of these studies. And lastly, most of the studies um, 
rarely were the examiners blinded to the exposure status or to the case status. And as well as very quantification in terms of exposure was presented, such as force, frequency, vibration, and merely they were uh, classified as uh, job titles. And we need more research to tell us more about these quantifications. So the second risk factor is manual work. That's the most controversial one, and just because we don't have enough research, it's not that it's not. It's very. It's it, so manual work could include um, like use of hands and it's like lifting, turning, pushing, pulling, banging, hitting, and these are just some classifications. There are other uh, classifications as well, and it is believed that the micro traumas may bring about this condition uh, in predisposed individuals. And there are some statistics that actually show workers who suffer repeated micro traumas of the hand are often affected. And those micro traumas bring about micro ruptures that are observed in the palmar fascia, and that, ha that has attributed to multiple injuries that are aggravated by manual work. And as you know, deputian contraction is a disease of the fascia. So micro ruptures are causing that. So in terms of research around manual work, Bennett in 1982 uh, researched um, 216 manual plant workers, and it was found 7.4% uh, had Dupuytren contracture, and the control group, which represented the general population, only uh, had one case. And it was concluded that the incidence of uh, Dupuytrens in the cases were greater than in the controls and also the prevalence was affected and because that was because of the particular type of work uh, namely uh, handling the 25 kilograms of sack so both of the control and exposure group were plant workers but the the exposure had handling of 25 kilograms of sacks and this repeated action may have led to low grade micro traumas to the palmar fascia leading to an increased incidence of dupedrins and listen stock in the review actually mentioned it is very small sample size but it was the highest quality uh, based on their review just to show you that how controversial it is in terms of manual work because of the lack of research. So one research in 2004 found that the incidence rate of Dupuytren contracture to be significantly higher in the non-manual occupation group than in the manual group beyond 65 years of age. But on the other hand, uh, in 2017, it was found that the risk for developing DC Dupuytren contractures become substantial after 30 years of a steady repetitive handwork. So evidence for and against for manual work is dispersed at best, basically. So the, the third uh, uh, risk factor is vibration, is the strongest evidence actually for development of Dupuytren contracture. Um, and research has shown that the cases of Dupuytrens with a history of vibration exposure are significantly higher than the cases without. There are uh, case, like Bovenzi in 1994 um, had found a significant association between vibration and diopitrins with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.6 for a confidence interval of 1.24 to 5.49. And it was adjusted for the regression analysis for age, alcohol, tobacco consumption. And uh, Lisa Nestock made a comment about that and said the findings showed consistent increased uh, relative risks addressed confounding fac um, factors in multi uh, multivariate models, and it was demonstrated that some evidence of increasing prevalence with cumulating lifetime vibration categories. So uh, there was another study by Thomas in 1992 that was talked about in Liss and Stock Review. Uh, it, was, it showed uh, there is an association between vibration and diopitrins, but it was some comments about the design of the study. So a study group that was examined was one with vibration exposure, was, was not uh, with a vibration exposure per se, but rather a subgroup of the vibration exposed population that develop a vibration white finger. So those developing vibration white fingers may differ from vibration exposed uh, subject in some way that may be associated with the development of uh, Dupuytrens. And since the control group also was drawn from patients being admitted to a hospital, so their location was uh, doubt uh, a, a little bit different, of course, from the ones who were exposed to vibration. So, but in general, it, it showed a positive association. 
And another research also in 1987 found that the cases of dupetrins with vibration exposure were significantly higher than the cases without. So on the other hand, the inclusion of the manual workers among the non-exposed uh, group may have diluted or masked the association in some studies. And that, that just means that it, the association might be even higher if we exclude those. When we, when we talk about vibration, it's important to take into account about gloves. So they also can cause an increase in vibration absorption when you're using gloves. And that's because you are uh, decreasing your, your sense of tactile, your, your touch sense. And therefore, the workers have to squeeze harder in order to get a feel or to feel what they are doing. And that's going to create a tension on the muscle that's going to increase the rate of absorption, vibration, so to the hand. And Lucas in 2008 actually examined the role of vibratory tools with deepest contraction and found an odd ratio of 1.7. And uh, another study in 1998 also stated proper glove fit and the ability of the glove to provide tactile feedback to the worker is the most critical. Another one in 2014 concluded that the risk of dupetrines is more than doubled in men with high levels of weekly exposure to hand transmitted vibration. So as you can see, glove as part of uh, as part of the vibrational uh, using vibrational tool is important to be a right fit because it has an effect. So next slide, please. Right. So we talked about Lucas um, again. So having a history of using vibratory tools, which yielded an odds ratio of 1.7. So in general, um, there is good support for an association between vibration exposure and dupetrine contracture. And the studies examined in the literature met a number of the criteria for causality, and that's exactly what was mentioned by Liz and Stock. However. Further studies need to be conducted to confirm the association of causality um, with regard to vib uh, vibration. Great, thanks, Maz. Now, we also uh, here at OCAL have uh, our own internal database of patient files that have been referred to us. And so I went through and looked at the, over the last 30 years, what were we seeing with respect to Dupuytren's contracture? And what I found was that 75% of all the Dupuytren's cases that were referred to us for determining work relatedness or compensation claims were from manufacturing, which were 27%, construction, that were 24%, and mining, that was 24%. So once again, industries with high amounts of vibration exposure. With respect to occupations, the top occupations that we found, miners, boilermakers, mechanics, millwrights, uh, laborers, construction trade helpers, electricians. So once again, more of the occupations that were reflected within the industries that we found as well. Now, with respect to treatments of dupatrins, there's basically two options. The first is non-surgical, where the treatment option depends on the severity of the underlying condition. So you can, can get temporary relief of the pain and inflammation through cortisone shots, heat and stretching treatments, wearing a splint at night to keep the finger straight, or a relatively newer technique is a collagenase injection, where an dr enzymatic drug that breaks down the collagen can be injected into the corded tissue to soften and weaken the contracture. And of 85% of the people treated, they had about a 50% reduction in their contracture normally within about 30 days. For surgical options, uh, when the joint at the knuckle reaches about 30 degrees of flexion, they've reached what is considered the criteria for surgery. The goal of the surgery is to allow the finger to straighten by removing the diseased fascia. The tension in the finger is released by removing the tight cords in the fascia. And if it recurs, the contractions are often more severe resulting in the surgeons either having to fuse the individual finger joints together, or in a worst, worst case situation, it may actually become necessary to amputate the fingers if the contracture affects blood or nerve supply leading into the ends of the digits. And for people who are interested, we've got three pages of references for you uh, if you want to go through them. 
and that brings us to the end of our presentation. So Val, do we have any questions? Yes, there are a few in the chat. Thanks, Trevor. Um, one was more a comment uh, at the beginning about the relationship between diabetes and the condition. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else about that as a pre-existing condition, but but uh, considering that material contribution aspect that Dave mentioned, um, or, or if enough has been said. I think enough has been said. I mean, I said the biggest thing with di type or diabetes is, is it type two, one, type two, or they need to look more specifically into the, uh, is it the secondary circulatory effects? Okay. Then there was a question, is there a similar condition in the feet? Um, and then some, and then there was a later answer, I guess, with the same person about later letter hose or later hose disease. Um, with the later that's correct, yes, it's letter hose disease because the 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 um duputrin is like it's a, it's a disease of the fascia and it can be um, also seen in the feet. It's called letter hose disease for sure, yeah. Great, thanks. And uh, does uh, duputrin's contracture include a weak grip that is butterfingers? I'm not uh, entirely sure about butterfingers. What I know uh, a little bit, I think uh, butterfingers are only affecting the tendons. Uh, and usually you, you, it's one finger that it's curled, or if you do an examination, it also can really extend fast when you are doing a fist and opening your fist. But in the fascia, it's a different case because then you are, press, you are putting pressure on the tendon. The tendon itself is not, it's not affected, it's the fascia that's affected and the pressure of that nodules and fibrous core that are putting on the tendon and therefore there is a secondary effect of your fingers to be affected your little fingers or your in, your ring finger that are um, that are curled and you cannot even extend them there is no hyperextension involved basically but i'm not entirely sure okay. i can look into that for, for sure if you want thanks Nurse. Um, and then there's another question. Is there any information available for DC and gaming? <laughs> um, <laughs> with respect to gaming, uh, you no know, repetition isn't really something that is being looked at as one of the proposed risk factors for Dupuytren's contracture. What you're seeing with gaming is more of a tendonitis of the fingers or uh, a tenosynovitis happening just due to sort of that repeated uh, rapid non rest interval with uh, often high impact forces when you're banging the butt. So, uh, no, I, I would say it's more of a tendonitis than it is anything to do with trips. Okay, thanks. And then there's a question of, about would the use of odds ratio as opposed to relative risk ratio be considered a limitation in these studies? Do you want to tackle that one or do you want me to do it? You can go ahead. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, it's really hard to say. Uh, one of the fact, I mean, and that's the biggest problem is we're, we're going back and we're cr looking at criticizing and critiquing uh, studies that were done previously when, you know, a lot of the methods that we had for data analysis and proper uh, experimental designs weren't there. But you no, know, to go back and re-examine the data, calculating relative risk is dead. Uh, would be very interesting to see if there actually was a difference. From all the studies I looked at, I mean, odds ratios were the only uh, stat used. I, Naz, I don't know if you came across any that you talked about relative risk at all. No, no, mostly odds ratios. Like even the recent ones are using odds ratios. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it it really is hard to say. Okay, thanks. So that's all the questions. Oh, here's another one. Has OCAO noted DC being reported while people are actively employed, or is there a latent effect with development of the condition? Uh, great question, because I mean, as we said, it normally tends to happen in individuals uh, over over the age of 40, but it, it is occurring in people who are actively working, but at the same time, there actually is a latency effect as well. Uh, I would say it's probably about a 60-40 split with 60 being uh, retired or close to the retire retirement age, so about 60% over the age of 60 and 40% under the age of 60. 